All right, so as we talked about a little bit, this class is dealing with geomechanics. Classically, this was called rocks, rock mechanics, and I talked a little bit about why that's changed because uh, the wording has changed because we also include man-made materials, concrete, cements, other synthetic materials, uh, man-made materials that, are, that behave like rocks. And when I say behave like rocks, the sort of main difference between the way rocks behave and, and the way you know s another engineering structural material would behave is that their rocks are heavily pressure dependent. Right? So again, down in the earth where they're under a lot of confinement pressure, confinement stress, they behave differently than they do at the surface where uh, they're unconfined. Right? So that's, that's one key difference and we'll talk about how that confining pressure works on rocks, right? So, uh, you know, the other key word in there is mechanics. So mechanics typically deals with, when we think of mechanics classically, you're, re you're really talking about the formulation and solution of the problems that deal with Newton's second law, right? F equals MA. Right? We've all had statics, so that's like F equals zero in that class, right? Um, and for the most part, you know, when you when you had, when you took statics, every structural thing in, in your in your analysis was a rigid body, typically. And then when you take solid mechanics, you learn that those rigid bodies are in fact not rigid, but they're deformable. And the way we compare the deformation between, you know, a leg of that chair and a leg of the 360 bridge, right, which are on a vast scale, different from one another, uh, is we normalize them by the area, right? So if we apply a force, if I sit on that chair, then we normalize my weight by the area of the leg, and that, then we call that stress. Right? And same thing, you know, when a car drives over the 360 bridge and applies a force to one of the, that's a suspension bridge. There's no legs on that bridge. Just anyway. <laughs> But uh, you know, some bridge that has legs on it, uh, South Congress Bridge, right? when a car drives over, applies a force to it, then we normalize that force by the area of that leg, and then that, that's a stress. And then we, we know something about the mechanical behavior, you know, the relationship between stress and strain. And that tells us a little bit how the material is going to deform. And ultimately, as engineers, usually, right, if you're a mechanical engineer, you, you want to design things that don't deform too much, or certainly don't deform to the extent that they fail. Uh, it turns out that in petroleum engineering, all the important mechanics we care about involve failure, right? or large deformation at least, right? Hydraulic fracturing, subsidence, other things like that, right? So, so we're going to include in our definition of mechanics or geomechanics the field of fracture mechanics. So we're going to learn a little bit about how materials fail, right, or fracture. Um, so, you know, I gave a little bit of uh, partial formal definition of stress, and, and that you know it's a force divided by an area, right? But um, we don't really no need that. We can talk colloquially about stress. Most of us know what it is, right? We certainly know what pressure is. Right? Swim down to the bottom of a pool, right? feel little ears hurt more, right? That's, that's pressure on your ears. That's the stress, right? They have the same units. Force divided by area. Um, when you have fully continuous bodies, we take those areas, the area of that leg, we take them and the, make them differentially small, right? And then we end up something we call a stress tensor. And we'll talk about that in this class. Because we need actually you know, the full stress tensor, which is sort of a three-dimensional definition of stress in order to analyze these stresses in the earth. Right? And it's ultimately the stresses in the earth that we care about most in this class, right? And so we'll have a, a little bit uh, of lecture to talk about where those stresses arise from. And principally, they arise from tectonic motion, right? So there's natural 
in situ stresses in the earth everywhere that for the most part are there because of tectonic motion, the motion of the plates. There are other mechanisms, but, but for the most part, uh, stresses arrive due to tectonic motion. So a little bit more about why stress is important in petroleum engineering. And we're here to have a couple of specific examples. So again, as I said earlier, even though you may not think mechanics is important in petroleum engineering, it turns out we have to drill a hole in the earth to get the fluids out. If you can come up with a better way, I'd be interested to know. But right now, we have to drill a hole in the earth. And anytime you drill a hole in anything that's under stress, there's a stress intensity associated with, with the far field stresses, right? So do you guys remember in solid mechanics, did you, did you look at problems with a like a hole in a plate problem. Did you look at that? Did you analyze that problem? So anytime you have a far field stress or anything with a hole or any kind of defect in it, it turns out that there's a stress intensity due to the fact that the hole is there. And so that stress intensity, in this case our hole is a well bore, that stress intensity can cause the stress in that region to ex exceed the strength of the rock and the rock can fail, okay? If it fails, and these are sort of an example, classically called breakouts, right? So these, uh, these, you see bits of material starting to crack and fail, and if this flakes off into the well bore, uh, there's almost every well bore in the world has some breakouts in it. And just because you have a, a few breakouts doesn't necessarily mean you have an unstable well bore. So an unstable well bore is when you have essentially breakouts all around the well, such that the, the integrity of the, of the circle or the well bore itself can't be maintained, and you get sort of continuous material falling down on the bottom hole assembly. Right? And then that can be a very bad thing if you're trying to drill, because right? you have to get that material out of the well. And so in that case, uh, if you had an unstable well, you'd have to set casing do something, you have to do some correction mechanism, deviate the well, set casing, do something, right? So if we understand about the mechanics of when we're going to have unstable well bores, the stresses in the earth, and the well bore stability ha has a lot to do with, especially in horizontal drilling, the direction you're drilling with respect to the principal stresses in the earth, right? The in situ stresses in the earth, and the strength of the rock, other things, right? So if we understand all that up front, then we can design a smart plan a priori, right, before we go and drill it. And hopefully the most efficient one would be, you know, setting the loose casing and all that because it's an expensive process. And, you know, if you have to deviate a well or set casing in the middle of drilling, uh, you know, in an unplanned way, that can be very expensive. Right? Uh, you know, another thing is we're going to study in this class, and, and really this is kind of where we start because it's a, sort of the simplest thing, is with respect to fault slippers, right? So uh, the big thing in the news now uh, with respect to hydraulic fracturing, they've kind of given up on the groundwater contamination, and now it's earthquakes, right? Well, uh, it, it's not necessarily, it's not, in fact, the hydraulic fractures causing that. It's injection of wastewater, wastewater disposal. That's, that's uh, you know, the amount of wastewater has gone up a lot uh, in the presence of hydro hydraulic fracturing. And so, uh, particularly in Oklahoma and North, North Texas, where there are some large faults in the basement rock, continuously injected at high rates, lots of fluid. And that fluid increases the pore pressure, right? So in, in reservoir simulation, we talk about depleting pore pressure because we're taking it out, right? But, but an injection well, you're, you're injecting or disposing of wastewater, increasing the pore pressure. When you increase the pore pressure, you increase the normal stress on the fault so that you sort of, you know, the, whether a fault's going to slip or not is dependent upon the forces resolved on that fault. So how much normal force, the force sort of holding the fault closed versus how much shear force and the friction factor, which is a material property of the rock. 
So if you increase the pore pressure due to fluid injection, you're basically uh, you know, releasing the normal force. And if that exceeds some criteria, the ratio of the normal force to the shear force with respect to the friction coefficient, then you could have a fault slip. Right? So that's what happens in induced seismicity or these earthquakes that are generated by injection wells. Of course, this also helps us in the production, right? In, the, uh, in, the, in you know, what we believe why shales, why shales um, uh, produce the way they do, is because when we produce a hydraulic fracture, we activate lots of mini earthquakes, tiny, tiny things that are 30,000 times smaller than you could ever feel at the surface. So many, many tiny slips on natural fractures that are already in the rock. Those slips make those more conductive pathways to the wellbore. And that's one of the reasons we believe that shale wells produce the way they do. Right? So in, in one respect, the slip can be very bad, earthquakes on large faults. And in one respect, on you know, small natural fractures, the slip uh, can act as a stimulation. Okay. So the other thing, uh, the other thing is, is reservoir depletion. right? So if we're producing a reservoir, we're taking fluid out of the pores. Right? In a sense, that fluid is in the pores is holding the rock up. And so if you take it out, you can get a collapse. And sometimes that collapse, that subsidence, can be measurable at the surface. Sometimes it can be as much as a meter or more. When we talk about oil sands and bitumen in Canada, it can be very, very large. Right? But even in a normal conventional reservoir, there have been measured in California subsidence of a meter due to the production of reservoir fluids. Sometimes the production of the fluids can actually help the production, right? Because what happens is we get something called, that's called compaction drive, right? So uh, it's sort of like squeezing a sponge, right? You're, you're taking the fluid out, but the weight of the earth on top of it is squeezing, squeezing more, and you get compaction drive, and it can actually help production. So if we understand that, to some extent, couple geomechanics into our simulators, uh, then we can maybe predict or help uh, you know, include those physics and, and help do better predictions that can possibly help the production and design a reservoir. Right? So of course, subsidence is usually a bad thing. Certainly, if your house is on top of it and the earth is subsiding one meter, you're not going to be happy. Right? So um, we'll, we'll uh, I think we'll stop here. The, the next lecture and a half is uh, basically structural geology, which will probably be a review from high school even. Uh, 